Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the briefing room. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your host for the very first briefing room in 2013. And folks, I'm really excited to say this is our fourth year doing the briefing room. We started way back in September of 2010. And uh, the rest is history. We had a very active year last year, as many of you probably know. We did 41 webcasts, which is a lot when you consider that we only do these at 4 o'clock Eastern on Tuesdays. So here is a slide about yours truly. That's in the New Orleans studio. And enough about me. The mission, as many of you now know, here in the briefing room is to reveal the essential characteristics of enterprise software. So basically, what we are trying to do is give you a very clear perspective, you in the audience, of what these technologies are, how they work, why they were designed a certain way, what they do, and of course, what they don't do. Because if you just read brochures about major software vendors, you would think that they all do pretty much the same thing. And of course, they all do big data, and that's all they do, right? That's obviously a joke. So January, we're talking about big data. February is analytics, March open source, April intelligence. We cover different topics each month in an effort to give you apples to apples comparisons whenever possible such that you as a decision maker can get, can get as much relevant detail and knowledge about these technologies as you possibly can because obviously when you pull the trigger on a big deal for enterprise software, it's not a small thing. These are typically not the most inexpensive tools to buy. That seems to be changing somewhat, but you can rest assured that enterprise software is always is going to be uh, a bit of an expensive endeavor because it takes time to build this stuff. So here's a sort of a tongue-in-cheek slide. There's no more small data. Of course there is. Uh, there's plenty of small data out there. But the nice thing that's happening these days is that we can leverage all kinds of different data sets. So it's not just the old relational database, transactional data, and the data warehouse that you can get value from. There are all these different streams of data, and that's the topic we're going to talk about today. So Robin Bloor is going to be our analyst. Of course, he is the chief analyst here at the Eponymous Bloor Group. Very pleased to have him online today. So SQL Stream, this is a very interesting company. I ran into these guys at the Oracle Open World Show, and they gave me a lowdown on, on what they do. And it's very exciting stuff. You know, one of the more interesting things for someone like myself in the business is when we come across a company that's been doing something for a, a number of years, but really were kind of ahead of their time in the early days. And that's the case with SQL Stream. They've been doing this, I'll let Damien tell you, but I want to say it's about 10 years or maybe longer. And uh, now, of course, it's hot stuff because everyone's talking about streams. And the reason you're going to hear more and more about data streams is because, quite frankly, you can get so much more done with so much less effort than was the case just five years ago because now we can handle this fire hose or these fire hoses of data that are coming off of machines, for example, mobile devices, all kinds of embedded processors in, in public domains, for example, out in public on traffic lights and in all kinds of places, RFID tags, of course, radio frequency tags. And if you can harness that data, if you can get some insight from those streams, while something is happening, that's where the title of this webcast comes from, Windows of Opportunity. As many of you know, if you do not strike while the iron is hot, well, what do you have to do? You have to heat the iron back up again. That takes time. It takes effort. And depending upon the use case, the opportunity may be gone. So the whole idea we're talking about here is that if you can capture and analyze a variety of streams in real time as these information flows are coming out, and you can sense patterns on them. And I think what Damien's going to talk about here is how their technology basically serves as a, a sort of translation layer that allows you to use the structured query language, SQL, which of course is a standard out there in data management, to superimpose on these data streams and then find opportunities. And you can find them so much faster than in the old days when you would have to bring all this stuff into a data warehouse, of course, you have ETL processes involved there, which is not just time-consuming but expensive. Then you need to get it out of the warehouse. And of course, if it's a large organization, guess what? The data warehouse is a political construct. It can be difficult for you and your department to get access to certain parts of that warehouse. Of course, it's also difficult to do stuff like this to a certain degree. But the point is that real time is where it's at these days. In fact, we have a whole report coming out this year on uh, real-time data. So the, the topic is event horizon, big data, and the real-time enterprise. We'll get into a lot of that stuff in our report. 
But with that, I'm going to introduce Damian Black. He is the founder and CEO of SQL Stream. Uh, as you can see, he's been around for about 20 years or so. He spoke at many conferences and was on GigaOM's first big data panel way back in 2008. And of course, that's like ancient history these days. So he is the author of 11 granted patents with five more pending. I couldn't help but muse to myself uh, a reference to the movie Spinal Tap, Alls Go to 11. Some of you may know what that all means. And with that, I'm going to hand the keys over to Damian Black. And Damian, if you would just click on that slide anywhere and use the down arrow on your keyboard, you will go through the slides. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, so Damian Black, CEO and founder of SQL Stream, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, big data on tap. It's all about how to um, unlock the power and value of your big data and, um, and how SQL Stream is making a contribution in this area. And let's start off with um, the corporate history. Eric, you're absolutely co completely correct. It was about 10 years ago um, that SQL Stream was founded uh, with the vision of trying to make uh, streaming big data, if you like, high velocity, high volume data um, available to everybody to easily be able to process in massive volumes and to be able to extract value and insights from the, from the data without storing the data first. Uh, hopefully that will become a lot clearer as we talk about what we do and how we do it. Um, so it's been a, a small undertaking of about uh, 10 years, as I said, over 150, well over 150 years of en engineering years of effort into the product. Um, currently five uh, patents, key patents, covering the basic notion of, uh, of relational streaming and streaming servers, um, processing relational operations continuously. Three more still pending. And um, we believe we've got some of the best uh, real-time technology and perhaps the most complete platform that's out there. And, and you can judge that from what we're presenting and, and how we look at the world. And we're certainly one of the leaders in streaming big data management. We're the only vendor that's based 100% uh, on true standard SQL right up to the 2008 standard. And uh, if you need to go beyond SQL, well, the whole thing is dynamically extendable uh, using C++, Java, and other, other constructs. Um, again, we use the mechanisms, the SQL standard mechanisms for extending SQL processing. But again, we do it continuously rather than oh. on demand over stored data. And then yeah. finally, um, we have a comprehensive set of adapters so that you can actually interface to all of your external right. sources of data and uh, the data that you uh, that you want to write to and other applications. So what we've been told here um, by a number of analysts now that 2013 is stacking up to be a key year for streaming data management. Um, it's going to emerge as a, as a core integration operational intelligence platform for real-time big data solutions within the enterprise. So first of all, what is, what is streaming big data management? Well, uh, it's of course big data, um, high volume, uh, normally high velocity data. It's about the real-time capture and collection of all of those data streams. Um, it's about continuous integration, enhancement, and ETL, getting them into applications and databases that you need that you, so you can still process it historically. And in the process, performing um, uh, low latency transformation and analysis on the data streams, keeping up with the streams in real time. And the effect uh, on the business is to enable businesses now to become real-time responsive to big data unlocking the power and value of the real-time data. First question on your mind might be, well, do I have real-time data sources? Where would they be? Well, um, first and foremost, you have log files and machine data scattered across your organization, which is a huge source of, of data, and there's no reason why you should not process that real-time as it's being written to and give you a chance to respond and react to the information. But increasingly, we're seeing sensor networks, sensors of all kinds, um, sending out real-time metric streams, valuable information, normally over the internet, um, call detail records in telecom, service records from e-commerce websites and other services, and then throw onto wireless networks, GPS and location data, and so on. The list uh, just continues. So let's look at some of the streaming big data in action based on you know engagements and that we've been involved in within SQL Stream. Um, Telematics is a hot area. Um, again, telco is looking for adding value beyond uh, simple data services, and telematics allows you to be able to remotely monitor the health of devices, systems, um, infrastructure. 
um, cloud-based uh, monitoring prediction of systems that are running uh, unusually hot or other problems that are happening across this obviously massive cloud infrastructure that uh, that is enabled. Um, intelligent transportation, an area that we spent quite a lot of time working on. Um, it was one of the early adopters of this kind of technology. Um, performing real-time congestion prediction and analysis of traffic flowing over the road networks. And now we're seeing similar interests over um, other kinds of networks from telecom to uh, data and so on. And a lot of that's incorporating GPS data. I'll come on as, as that as an example later on. Uh, social media, where you want to get real-time uh, visibility into sentiment based on people's you know, real-time tweets. In telecom, we might see uh, interest, and we're seeing interest in quality of service, capacity planning, again, analysis for billing purposes, fraud. Internet services around e-commerce, um, looking at the uh, websites and other services and games that are delivered over the Internet. A high performance computing, HPC, uh, often that's processing very large volumes of log data, uh, continuously on a massive scale. And last and certainly not least, banking, um, traditionally large, uh, generating large amounts of data, both market and transactional, and where you want to look into and get insights into it for reasons of fraud, compliance, and, and many other reasons too. So the requirements for the platform, um, first of all, you've got to collect all of the data. Then you've got to um, analyze and integrate it continuously in real time and then deliver and share the results to dashboards, to databases, to applications, and perhaps all of the above. And you want to do that in a distributed, you know, scalable streaming platform, which is doing this continuous analysis integration. And you want to have options to both deliver on-premise and in the cloud. You want this system to be able to process this stuff in a highly parallelized, distributed fashion so that you know it will grow and scale with your needs. And um, we claim that you really want to do it with something that's standards compliant and ideally uh, SQL standard, so you get the benefits that have been afforded over the decades of SQL processing, which is automatic optimization, and tapping into the readily available skills there with millions of people familiar at some level with SQL language. Not SQL like, but true SQL standards compliance. That's what we'd, SQL Stream has been focusing on, on delivering on these platform requirements. So where does the pain and the problems come from it. It's threefold, really. It's starting off with the data explosion problem, uh, making it basically exponential growth in the data volumes, making it too costly to be able to analyze the data in real time using conventional techniques and technologies. It's a problem of business agility where you're able to, not able to respond quickly enough to new market requirements, seeding grounds to new upstart competitors, and also facing competitive threats from people who might be able to move faster than you. And then finally, it's the complexity, the headache of trying to use parallel processing to take advantage of the modern, inexpensive, multi-core um, and blade server architectures. But it's very difficult to do that with conventional parallel technology. It's low level. You deal with threads, race conditions, lockups, and any other number of problems. So SQL Stream has a very simple model that you will just present for how you're going to um, slash the total cost of ownership in terms of providing easy scalability on a very simple model where you process streams coming in and you output streams. Those streams of results, very similar to running queries over tables. What you have here is a bit like relational tables, but data are always being ended, appended to the end of the table with timestamps. And you have all of these queries running continuously. Uh, on the business agility side, you can use proven SQL view technology to be able to create new views for applications whenever you need them and to plug in new data sources. And we take, we extract all the parallelism fr from the SQL definitions that you provide, and we take onto our shoulders the problem of, of executing this stuff in a highly parallelized, massively parallel environment. If you look at the headache in terms of data transformation and collecting, you, there are many applications in your organizations that can take advantage of the information if only you were able to get it in the right format and at the right time to be able to process the information. So with all of these log files and sensors and cell phones and other source smart devices that are generating data, you have to combine the information so that each of those applications is able to process it. And of course, you'd like to put it also into your data warehouses and perhaps now into your big data repositories based on Hadoop and other technologies. So what does that mean? Um, that means that you often now are forced to do point-to-point translators and connectors or put in point solutions to deal with these N sources and M sinks. You have this horrible N times M mesh to deal with, and that costs you money, time, and it's complicated. 
So what we do is we provide a simple, simplifying layer. You just plug in data sources straightforwardly, again, using the SQL standards for how you access and wrap around external data sources and make them look relational. And um, you also uh, are able to tap in and create any SQL views that you require and to process the information without stopping the existing applications, without stopping the processing that's going on, and doing this, and executing all of these queries continuously against the incoming streaming data without storing data first. Good noise on the line. I apologize for that. It's not, I think it's uh, not on my end. Yeah, so I hear that. I don't know where that's coming from. I'm trying to mute all these so lines. You process the streaming information continuously again Participant without Participant lines data. muted. Sorry, go ahead. Without storing the data first, so that we stream out the delta stream, the incrementally new answers that correspond to the incrementally newly arriving data. And you have any number of these queries running continuously. And in the process, they'll be performing things like analytics and aggregation, correlation, uh, generating alerts and alarms, maybe updating dashboards, all of these applications, assembling the data that are required, and performing continuous ETL. So the benefit of this is you have now the SQL language, the technology that you are familiar with and proven in data warehouses over the years, you can use the same technology now, but operating real time and having real time data assembled by the system using the same techniques of auto optimization and query optimization and um, assembling the data in the time and in the format that are required and combining records not only from all of the incoming data sources, but also enhancing them with data from external databases and systems. So that's and that, in, in doing so, we've now changed this complexity and removed this from an n times m problem to just an n plus m, where you can just plug in new data sources, create new views without disturbing the existing applications function. So if you look at the problems now in terms of latency and wanting to try and remove latency, if you look at existing approaches, what you have is a high latency approach, whether you're putting data into databases or into Hadoop. You have a number of phases that you have to go through. You have each phase has to finish before the next one can start. You have data collection, then you're going through the cleaning, the cleansing, and then enrichment, uh, aggregation, integration. And when that's finished, you'll do your analysis, and then you'll be able to share and deliver results. And uh, what you have here is hours of latency and sometimes even days of latency as this thing sort of cascades through and gets finished. What we do is now we replace this by an overlapped, parallelized um, a process where the data flows straight the way through all of the elements that are running continuously. And so you have collection elements that are feeding cleansing elements that are feeding enrichment and integration elements that then feed analysis elements. And then as soon as results are available with the minimum latency, they'll flow straight out and you can take actions in real time. And it does this in a very simple way. And it does this with a technology that's called Dataflow. It's been around now for several decades. And the process of data flow is to basically, you'll see it in today's hardware under the hood. Um, and um, we use the data flow technology, though, as a so the software layer, where you have a number of queries that are basically feeding other queries and maybe get compiled down to subqueries. What you have is a network of queries feeding other queries and data flowing. Here we have six streams coming in and four streams that flow out. I wish I could show you the animated version of this. You'd see all of those packets flowing across the, the, the network of processing here. And what happens there is they feed the query elements that process the data, and as soon as results are available, they feed the next layer. So you have parallelism in two dimensions here. You have pipelining going left to right, and as individual queries spread, spread out and fan out, you have something called superscalar parallel processing, where you have multiple processes operating in parallel over different partitions of the data. The result of that is a fine-grained parallelism it's because you just have to worry about your simple, simple SQL queries and, and referring to other existing streams, SQL Stream will pull out for you and extract all of this parallelism and execute it um, in, across all of the available cores and hardware. And what you have then is a simple, massively scalable, super fast model for creating your real-time parallel processing. So that's data flow, and that's how we take advantage of that. If you look at a, a real-world example of a query, this was actually part of a, an application that we developed for one of the leading cloud um, computing um, infrastructure vendors. And what they wanted to do was to detect um, 
CPU cores that were running hot in their application. They didn't want to just detect simple uh, hitting thresholds. They wanted to look at acceleration of CPU usage. So they wanted to ma monitor the entire cloud and then identify those particular cores and applications that were running unexpectedly hot. And the reason for that is that you pay, you know, as a customer for the amount of resource you're using, so these people would get unexpectedly high bills if perhaps the application had gone into a loop. And it would also degrade the performance uh, that you'd ex um, experience from the other applications that are sharing the same physical infrastructure. So it's a, a no-win situation. Everybody is unhappy. So the technique they wanted to use was Bollinger Bands, which you may have heard come across before in other areas. It was originally, I think, used in financial services. And what you do with Bollinger Band analysis is you maintain a moving average and a moving standard deviation, which helps smooth out and, um, the, the, uh, the ups and downs of the various metrics. And then you want to detect um, when, you ha when the, the actual data value hits a, a goes above two standard moving standard deviations of the current moving average. And you use that as a trigger to indicate something suspicious. Well, the way that we catch that in the streaming SQL query in SQL is, um, and SQL stream is very simple and straightforward. You have a nested query, which is computing over a window. And as the data enter the window, a one minute rolling window, we compute the average, the continuously compute the uh, moving average and the moving standard deviation over that window period. And in fact, but we can use a, a construct called partition so that we can basically compute or process conceptually millions of streams with a single query. And what we're doing here is maintaining a different analytic, in this case for each service URL, but it could be for each account number, each stock symbol, um, each machine and core or application, a process ID. It really doesn't matter. You just put in some key there, and it will maintain these metrics on a per key instance basis. The results are then streamed out as S. And at the outer level of the query, you just detect the situation of where you are going, two standard deviations, spiking above two standard deviations, and emit that as a result. Very simple, very straightforward, very powerful. And on a four-core server within SQL Stream, we can run this at somewhere around about half a million events per second. So if you want to add servers or add cores, clearly you can move into very, very big streaming data sizes of millions of events per second, very straightforwardly. Um, to give you another example, showing a bit more of the architecture, within SQL Stream 2, we have agents, remote agents, which um, will collect, for example, tail log files and follow the rotation uh, principles that you've put in place, find the data and read them and tail them as they are being written to so that they turn them into real-time streams. And we have the same thing for processing sensor data, socket data, um, a whole bunch of adapters that will connect to the information sources you want to connect to. And what they do is write over an optimized binary protocol using actually, which is then wrapped around JDBC so that you can write your own agents and own adapters using JDBC and still get the same optimized binary representation designed to scale up to very high volumes. It then feeds the SQL stream uh, servers, which will do the uh, enrichment analysis and then sharing and delivering results and potentially um, combining the data again with external data from systems and databases. And this particular application example is drawn from an analyzing uh, handsets over cellular networks and uh, looking to try and um, optimize and minimize the chance of dropping calls. And uh, this application, the core server is processing about 300,000, uh, four core server, 300,000 um, messages per second, very large messages. And the agents themselves are um, collecting all of the information around the network and uh, performing some kind of parsing and filtering and delivering the information to the SQL Stream server. And the system as a whole is processing well in advance of a million events per second, again, with a simple four-core server at the heart of the whole thing. So the actual product portfolio, the key building block is the S server. Um, the S stands for streaming. Um, and um, it is runs on various flavors of Linux. And it is based on the SQL 2008 standard. But again, it runs queries as any number of queries continuously without storing the data first uh, versus the traditional SQL servers that will store the data and run queries periodically on demand. S-Analyzer is currently an alpha version. We are delivering that as a runtime now to some customers that want to take advantage of this real-time visualization capabilities. And within the first half of this year, we expect to provide the full development version. 
And what that does is it enables you to take the benefits of being able to build um, applications of the kind that you get with many of these um, log file management uh, solutions like Splunk, where you can get real-time visualization of the data. And uh, without having to write any SQL, you can get the full power of the system in terms of its parallel processing and its scalability and distributed architecture. And then you can further extend that using the full power of SQL if you want to, uh, to go beyond that <clears throat> to enhance the analysis with other SQL logic. SStudio um, uh, runs uh, on Windows as well as Linux. It's our management and developer console. Again, following the idea of not inventing standards but adopting them, it's a plug-in into the industry Eclipse standard. So again, very familiar for then people who have used Eclipse, which is used in, in very many products now. SCloud is a S server available over Amazon EC2 with a slightly different pricing model so that we can host that for you and uh, provide you access as a service. And then finally, S-Transport um, provides uh, modules of SQL, about 25 pages worth of SQL, to provide you powerful geospatial and location analytics, all written in SQL with uh, plugins for Google Earth and, and, and so on. A couple of application examples. Um, we became quite well known by uh, some people because we were one of the very few um, closed source companies that um, are very prominent in the open source world. Uh, displayed on Mozilla Firefox's download stats. And if you want to, to um, go onto YouTube, you can uh, Google, um, you can um, search for uh, Mozilla Space Glow, and you'll find many videos of this in action. And there we had Powered by SQL Stream on that page, and it was performing real time analytics over all of the log files, uh, downloads for, for Firefox around the world, um, checking that those downloads were completed and valid and uh, allowing those to be revisualized in real time on the display on the screen. Um, and while writing all the data to Hadoop for offline analysis, a highly scalable, highly public real-time uh, solution. We've done two versions of that, the analytic application for Mozilla. With the Australian government, what we provided um, was real-time visibility into the road networks. And we see applications in other kind of networks too, of course. Again, it's about 25 pages of SQL. We own all of the intellectual property. They were very kind to grant that to us. They're a leader in intelligent transportation, exporting technology around the world for things like traffic light synchronization. And this combines GPS sensor data around vehicles with traffic sensors to provide a real-time picture down to the resolution of 10-meter segments of the road. And unlike other kind of systems such as Google's and Navtex that you might be able to buy um, access on the marketplace, because it's all in transparent SQL, it's easy for them to extend and to put in their own custom alerts, their own custom metrics and indicators that they care about. And it renders everything out on Google Earth or Google Maps. So again, a very familiar, easy interface to use. If you want to use the same thing for doing other kind of location-based services, again, it can be readily adapted to do things, anything that might has to sort of deal with a something that can be rendered physically uh, over Google Maps, Google Earth, or additional um, location visualization technologies. A comparison now um, with operational intelligence solutions and other traditional big data solutions such as the Hadoop stuff that's out there, uh, and comparing it with SQL Stream. You know, whilst we, are, we, are, we provide a different approach, um, we are providing continuous streaming uh, capabilities. But if you compare us to something like, for example, a Splunk or perhaps a Cloudera, then we provide, you know, for a start, very low latency, true real time, and complete answers, rather than if you're taking the case of some of these log file processing companies, have very simple query processing, simple pattern matching and readily expressions, we have the full power of SQL to be able to deliver what you need. So that you're never going to run out of power. Whatever business need you might have, we are able to be able to process that with sophisticated analytics that are optimized and, and run in real time in a massive parallel fashion. And that can include joins and correlations, so you can combine and compare information in real time, and allow you also to be able to enrich and integrate data. And the scalability, you've given you some idea of how that thing, this thing can scale up to huge volumes. Most of these uh, log file systems have very limited scalability. They're not really parallel processing. And in the case of Hadoop technologies, they're great for doing batch-based processing, but it's not going to be parallelism at the level of granularity that you can get in SQL Stream, and it's very, very far from real time. And finally, the development ease. Um, recently in one customer application, we found that uh, using other competing technologies, it took, I mean, they told us 100, 100 classes 
uh, of Java code wrapped around other streaming paradigms versus, and they were somewhat sheepish talking to us about um, five pages of SQL code which solved their problem entirely. And they were unable to solve it using conventional um, imperative languages such as Java. They picked up problems that their R&D departments had uh, failed with. So uh, we were very excited to see that and uh, very heartening just to see how the power of SQL, that is a very high level language, you can do so much. So we think this is an important new missing data management quadrant. Um, if you look at the top level as high level declarative and at the bottom as low level imperative, where you, the top level you specify what you want and you let the system in a high level language decide how to optimize to do the processing. At the bottom level, you go step by step and you um, tell, you know, build programs effectively to, to process the information. On the left here, we look at historical analysis performed on demand. On the right, we look at continuous analysis performed real time. Then what you have in the top left corner is data warehousing, relational databases, where you run queries with high level declarative SQL on demand, hopefully very quickly. Well, what we do is we make those queries, those databases better. We query the future continuously and we will enhance that continuous analysis with the on-demand query the past results that you get from databases. We also make messaging middleware better. Messaging middleware uh, is stream processing, but where all the logic is being performed in, in programs dotted around your network. And um, so, if, for example, if you're processing customer interaction data, service data, and trying to detect good prospective customers or detecting fraud or something like that, you have to write programs to do that analysis. Well, within SQL Stream, you can be fed by the messaging middleware with our adapters, but you can then subscribe now to high-level views of, for example, a prospective customer or a prospective uh, candidate for a customer loyalty program or looking for a particular fraudulent activity. And underneath that, there'll be a whole pipeline of queries and subqueries that will be sifting, filtering, aggregating, compiling the data to deliver to you in real time just the results you care about, and again, in the format and in the time that you care about too. And finally, last but not least, is the Hadoop area, the big data, the bottom left quadrant. And there, it's processing data, admittedly in a parallel fashion um, in the case of Hadoop, but it's processing big globs of data, different parts of stored files, operating upon those files again in low-level programs. And so what we see as messaging middleware is kind of like the real-time mirror image of the distributed real-time version of what you're doing in Hadoop and big batch data. And what we are in the streaming world is providing the real-time continuous complement to the batched on-demand uh, approach of, of big data in Hadoop. So finally, you know, this is where we believe we deliver on the uh, big data on tap, let you tap into any of the insights and, and to the huge volumes of data that are being uh, delivered in your organization to pull out the analysis that you want. We come back to the data explosion by slashing the cost of ownership for real-time analysis with a very simple and scalable approach based on familiar SQL that allows you to process everything continuously and in real time. We allow you to tackle your business agility issues by creating new views and applications very easily with very high-level familiar SQL and plug in new data sources without rebuilding your systems as you might in kept type technologies, without um, disturbing your existing infrastructure and just plug in new data sources and new views and life just goes on beautifully cleanly. And finally, the complexity. We take onto our shoulders all of the pain of doing the parallel processing, lock-free scheduling, taking advantage of the cores and hardware. We make the parallel processing very simple, scalable, and fast. So that's it. That's, uh, that's what SQL, SQL Stream uh, is, is all about. Okay, great great job. And I'm going to queue up Robin Bloor here just in one quick second. I'm going to hand you the keys right now, Robin. And that's some really, really interesting stuff. We were tweeting the daylights out of it while you were talking. And, folks, we see cool stuff on this show all the time, as many of you know. But this is right at the top of the list. So this is good stuff. So, Robin, the floor is yours. Go ahead and uh, push your slides, and we'll get to the Q&A after that. Okay. Yeah, I have to kind of agree with you, Eric. It, it, this is a very interesting product, I have to say. Um, and actually the presentation that I prepared, having looked through the slides before the presentation but not having talked to the vendor, I'm kind of slightly off beam, but it doesn't really matter. Well, what we are researching this year is events, basically. So 
the way we look at it at the moment is that Hadoop has become a data re reservoir, basically, um, because it's flexible and it's scalable. Um, and, and when I say flexible, you can drop just about any data you want in there. So all of the other, what one would call um, previous um, generations of database products that had limitations, Hadoop doesn't really have any limitations as to what you can actually drop in there. Um, and it's a multi-purpose en uh, multi engine, and, and an awful lot is made um, about the parallelism of Hadoop, but Hadoop isn't actually a very good parallel engine at all. Um, it's not a performance engine, and it, its beauty is in its versatility. Um, there's also the case that sometimes you don't really have to drop data into Hadoop first. Uh, it's not necessarily a first port call of data, and it certainly wouldn't be in streaming applications, because if you're actually grabbing streaming data, you don't want to waste time dropping the data into Hadoop before you process it. Um, and sometimes it may be actually better just to leave data where it is. So it isn't going to be, you know, the only um, sink of data that exists in the organization. Or Hadoop isn't going to take the whole space, but it can take a lot of the space. And it's certainly going to be used as a repository for events of um, many different kinds coming from outside or inside the organization. When we look at event processing, I kind of make a vague uh, distinction between what I call real-time event processing, which really is what SQL Stream's about. Uh, you get absolute real-time when you're actually processing off the fire hose itself. So a data stream is coming from somewhere, it doesn't really matter where it's coming, but you're getting it to yourself as fast as you can, and you're processing it as it arrives. I refer to CEP applications as just a little bit back of that, but not actually much further back of that. They're almost real time. But in that situation, in this diagram here, I've got this event filtering and replication and routing. You might have a little bit of middleware that's directing the events to the CEP applications. Then you have a dupe and various uh, uh, repositories to, to drop the data in as, uh, I don't know, as an intermediate or as a final location for it. Um, and if you just look at this diagram up at the top as to the sources of data, the cloud's a very big thing, so it's a big source of data, but also um, embedded processes are a big thing already, and they're going to become a very big thing. Possibly there will be more data flying around within probably five or ten years from embedded processes and from everything else put together. I mean, it, they're just getting deployed by the billions now. Um, and data streams are kind of what comes out of embedded processes, but you also get aggregated data streams from various I don't know, networks. Um, and you've got the whole mobile world, which is providing us with information. We've got desktops and we've got the servers providing us with information. And my kind of view of events is, well, events are happening all over the place, and an event-driven architecture would be to process them all. But um, what we're talking about today is SQL Stream. This is um, event stream processing, or at least the, the examples that Damien has discussed are event stream processing, where you're looking for an event window. The window is um, a certain amount of time or possibly a certain number of events. You could kind of cut it either way. Uh, and the thing that you're doing that nothing else can do is that you're able to examine these events in parallel and find correlations with them, respond to those correlations. So things that we think of, um, the, or the applications that one naturally thinks of for this are things like, you know, network security, where there may be threats, multiple threats happening within a network. And you need to look at a window to try and sort out the threats. But there are many, many events, and you have to pluck them out the window. Um, but this idea of, um, of an event window, an event window can be an hour long, it could be a day long, it could be a month long, you know. So there are situations where one would want to be actually looking at his historical data and processing perhaps a long window. That isn't so much what SQL Stream is about. SQL Stream is about where you've got a setting to look at it, you know. Oh, if I understand it right, I'm sure Damien is going to correct me if I've got that wrong. I don't know if I'm um, allowed to jump in now or do that later. <laughs> okay. Um, Real-time BI, um, which is what this is about or what this can be about. It actually could be, you know, automatic trading or something like that. But real-time BI could also be called operational intelligence, and I like to think of it in that way. It's like 
it, it's almost as though if you think of a cycle, um, a feedback cycle that's going on um, in an organization, organizations have time cycles that go like annual, go for uh, a month, go for a week, go for a day, but operational intelligence is when you're actually responding to the outside environment, so the feedback loop is very, very short. Uh, and, and this is uh, an area where one wants to be processing streams and responding to what's happening in the streams. Um, but it poses three problems. How to establish the stream data flow and the acceptable speed. How to process the data and how to manage the data. Uh, and those are some of the questions I guess I'll be asking um, Damien about uh, when I finish talking about it. The, the only other side comment that I wanted to make is that we are familiar with the issue of data life cycle. We've been familiar with that issue for a long, long time. I mean, you know, like decades. You know, this issue didn't just evaporate with the advent of big data and streams processing. It actually became more important. You know, we still have to worry not just, you know, we grab the data and we get value out of the data. We perhaps derive intelligence from the data. But the question is, where do we put it? And where do we, you know, after it's our first date with it, where do we take it? <clears throat> and that's something that needs to be um, uh, thought about in the big data world and also actually in the, in the streaming world. So I have a, a series of questions, but actually the questions that I started writing out as I was listening to you speak, Damien, were mm -hmm. uh, actually different. <laughs> <laughs> because, it, yes. I mean, the first thing, the first one actually does apply. Uh, you, and I immediately um, thought of um, the other uh, event processing databases, and I thought that that's what, actually what you're going to be talking about. Um, but you aren't really a database, you're a data flow engine. And, and that kind of threw me. I suppose I should have been able to deduce that from your slides, but it, I didn't. Um, so, the, I mean, the question is, do you have your own data store? Well, um, we do have a data store just for the metadata, you know, because that's the bit that, that is long-lived and... Uh, has to be transacted, but that can be targeted and adapted to whatever uh, corporate standard you want to use. We do supply one within the product just for managing the metadata. Um, but um, we are our own SQL engine, uh, except that we don't process the data uh, stored from disk. We process it stored in, in the buffers of the, of the memory of you know, the main memory of your servers, not, not flash memory, but true high performance main memory. But the interesting thing to pick up on your comment um, earlier, if you uh, be so kind, I mean, talk about um, you know some trends and, and windows. Um, when you're running queries against databases, of course, and data warehouses, you are running against uh, windows already, but they're implicit windows. They're the windows of your data retention policy, and it might be 30 days, it might be 12 months, and you'll age out data, and new data will come in. Just very often, you're only dealing with one implicit global window. Uh, when you start bringing down uh, the, the, the uh, business logic to where you need to start making decisions continuously, each query may have its own different retention window, and uh, they may be yeah, they may be in milliseconds, they may be in months. Uh, and uh, what the SQL Stream approach is to allow you to handle all of those cases, and we do it all in main memory. But um, I was recently at uh, Oracle Open World, and Larry Ellison just um, indicated that their whole future strategy for databases is to store all of the information, all of the data warehousing information in the main memory of servers because it's just got to the price point now where memory is cheap enough to make that viable. And of course, it allows things to go very quickly. Well, one of the big benefits of the SQL Stream model in that case is that as the data ages out of the windows, we immediately recover the space and we've got the whole system optimized to be able to process and take advantage of the you know, multi-layer caches that you have within the modern uh, pipelined architectures and to be able to process the information very quickly. So a little aside there on, on, on the database and data storage of Windows, if that, if that makes sense. If it does, oh, that was, that was that very was. welcome. That's a, I think that's a really interesting point of view. And that, I would agree with Larry Ellison and presumably yourself that, that data will eventually all reside in my memory. I mean, ob obviously, the big heaps of data are going to live on disk because yeah. You know, it's going to be a long, long time before memory gets that cheap. And we love, we love Hadoop because it, it solves that problem, actually does solve a problem for us, particularly around age base, which allows you to have sort of a faster keyed access into the data. 
uh, because it is, as you said, I mean, it's basically a repository. It's, it's, it's what we view as an active archive. I mean, Cloudera, if you talk to Cloudera's CTO, he'll tell you quite uh, openly that there are two big use cases for Cloudera's Hadoop technology is um, active archive. In other words, you can store off all of the, in our case, the streams that you've, uh, you can decide what you want to store, whether it's the raw streams, the clean streams, the results of analysis, or all of the above. But unlike uh, conventional archives where, you know, as soon as it's archived, the data dies, you never see it again because no one ever bothers to reload it. When it's on Hadoop, you can replay it, you can access it, you can use it to enhance other things. If you're using HBase, it's fast enough. And so uh, the data doesn't die, it still becomes part of uh, your assets. Um, and, but it does. it is inexpensive enough compared to data warehousing that you can afford to keep everything. So putting a streaming front end, processing all of the data that are coming in, and then ensuring that you keep everything at the other end, so you, should you uh, so choose, you get the best of both worlds, we believe. Oh, right. And is that the way that you get frequently your customers operate now, is that you, uh, when you finish with the data, you just actually archive it straight into Hadoop? Is that normal? Well, uh, some people can just leave it. And, I mean, we're processing lo very often log files, and so they already have an archiving mechanism in place for those oh, log right. files. Oh, right, yeah, of course. But, that, you know, but, but what we're seeing now is that people are starting to uh, use Hadoop as that archiving mechanism. I mean, that's what happened at, uh, at Mozilla. I mean, they are obviously sharp guys, and so in the second version of the download stats, the Mozilla Glow, they archived everything into Hadoop. And, uh, you know, I, we thought, well, if it's good for Mozilla, it's good for our customers too. Right. So the the other thing, you, you explained your parallelism as data flow. I'm not sure how many of the audience actually um, properly understood what you've explained, but uh, I'm actually, and you can you can enhance and correct because I'm damn sure you know an awful lot more about this than me. But you know, the way that most people nowadays understand parallelism is because they've met MapReduce and they understand that MapReduce um, allows you to segment data across many many different processes, and and if you do that in a rational way, then you will go an awful lot faster than if you only have a few processes. However, what what SQL Stream is doing is not just that, that would be data partitioning, it's also doing process partitioning where you're running parts of process through um, multiple sorts, or also called pipeline processing. And the thing to note about that, um, and you know, I'm speaking to the audience, is this is a damn sight faster than just straight data parallelism. You know, if they, I mean, I have no idea how good the code under underlying SQL Stream is, but um, I have no I, I have no doubt whatsoever that if the code is really neat and really um, tied it away, it will go at extraordinary speed. Would you like to comment, Dan? Yeah, well, it's going to be a lot lower latency and a much finer level of parallelism. And uh, the execution engine is written in C++. The, the, there's a scheduler which basically tries to work out how to take advantage of the current available cores and servers. And it tries to then reschedule little parcels of work without using locks, which is very, very technically demanding. And it's the kind of thing that would be beyond most people. It was uh, certainly a, a big challenge for us. It took us uh, a couple of years to get it really working to the state that it is right now. So um, what that does is it takes the, the pain off the shoulders of customers and lets them uh, take advantage of this at the high-level SQL level, which anybody can do. Um, the other thing to mention here is, uh, yeah, I mean, the actual size of the engine is about 1.3 million lines of code, so it's it's a non-trivial undertaking. It's something that's uh, it's been going for a long time. Yeah, uh, I, a lot of work. I understand why you mentioned locking because locking's been a, uh, you know, it's been a, a place of pain for all database well, it's Anybody that has data, yeah. yeah. A huge pain for us in getting this stuff working. <laughs> you can imagine, and getting it working in a kind of reliable, deterministic way, so that you get the same answers out when you keep running the stuff again and again, which is also important. Um, and the thing here about unstructured data, which I think is worth uh, a very, very good question, yeah. because we get asked this occasionally and getting off, asked it more and more now. Well, we're actually very good for unstructured data, too, because um, a lot of the pain around structured data, unstructured data, is, you know, or having to, all data, in fact, is storing it on disk, and it's hard to restructure it afterwards. But well, we don't store it on disk. We process it in main memory, and we process it continuously. And then we'll stream it out into, some, into stores like Hadoop, should you wish, or if you want to do it, stream it out into data warehouses, or both. Um, and so we can create as many inconsistent views of the information as we want, each streaming out its set of results. 
And if you want to process things like XML, etc., we have XML parsers built into the product. And, and there's oh, a, really? You know, you can, oh, yeah. So you can. What you tend to do is you take your unstructured data and you add columns, you add attributes, and as it goes through the oh, pipeline, right. it grows these extra attributes. If you take a voice message, it may get piped out to a new on server, and you can extend beyond SQL using okay. the standard way within SQL standard that you can do that. And we use that mechanism then, so you can pipe stuff out to, for example, new new on servers and come back with a fragment of text, which is the, uh, the English language or whatever language it is, um, encapsulation of the message. And so that becomes another attribute. And then we actually have a gate adapter. So you can parse then that, analyze the, the language fragment, and bring out the sentiment, the key sentiment keywords. And those last attributes then you can then use to sort, route, and, and process the data, because you need to have some sort of structure ha structured handle on it to be yeah. able to, to do something useful with it. And so, yeah, we can handle both structured and unstructured data all based around the uh, the same paradigm. Yeah, right. It, it, it's this isn't yeah this isn't obvious. It wasn't obvious to me when I looked your slides. But even actually, I, this can, conversation could go for a long time, and it can't because we don't have a long time. However, it, it, there's, there are some interesting things here. I mean, you um, put up this idea of um, processing the whole data flow in parallel, and you mentioned data cleansing. And my first thought was, well, what data cleansing capabilities have you guys got? Um, in the sense that we now associate data cleansing with some very um, specifically built um, software, which, which works in a particular way and allows you to define rules and things like that. So I'd, pro I'd like you to to speak to how you would do that data cleansing thing. I mean, are you just coding it? Because you're not writing it in SQL, are you? So um, we don't uh, profess to be able to do provide all of the high-level kind of, you know, um, uh, synonym recognitions and so on that you can do with other systems. But what you can do then is you can hook in those systems that will look for, for example, variants of people's names or addresses or different spellings and stuff like that, and use them to enhance the data as it goes through and process it with SQL Stream. So that we then become a vehicle to, to, for you to reuse and get better value from your existing investments and technologies there. But what we can do is if you're able to do your data validation logic in SQL, and that may be comparing values with external systems, external databases. It may be doing simple sanity checks continuously. Then that, that logic will run extraordinarily quickly because we will pull out the parallelism from it and we'll execute it in a parallel fashion with minimal latency. And if you think of most, a lot of ETL type jobs today, you have to sort of arbitrarily chop them up into, into different buckets and you you know into little batches or mini batches and you have to decide yeah. where the you know partition ends is for each of those batches well we don't have to do that with ours because you you know you're thinking about continuous processing and in fact you know more and more all processes are continuous because as services are available 24/7 around the world there is no nighttime window and there is no natural sort of well it stops here and starts there type thing and that just goes much more elegantly into the continuous processing uh, paradigm and it's just nice that the continuous processing paradigm can also deliver results real time. By the way, you don't have to use SQL Stream in real time mode. You can actually operate with embedded times. Mm -hmm. And so we can replay data for scenario analysis, for data mining benefit purposes, for, for checking and validating and so on. So we can actually also operate around historical data. Of course, obviously, what we're doing then is replaying time as fast as we're able to process it rather than going at the wall clock hour. So a couple of comments there. That was kind of a question there. I wasn't exactly going to ask that question, but it was related to a question I was going to ask. That's really interesting. I mean, that really is because you, you are, I mean, what we're doing in terms of our research this year is we're homing in on the idea of just an event world because, you know, the transactional world vanished a long time ago. And, and now we have a vast number of products that are processing events. But you're actually the heart of it, the way that, I mean, the way that this conversation is going. It, it's exactly right. In a, a certain number of things that what you're doing is exactly balanced to how the world out there is happening. You want to be able to perceive the events as fast as possible that really matter to you. You want to isolate them. You want to be able to respond to them. And that's um, a, a bit like, you know, thinking of an organization as a human being who touches a hot stove. They want to take their hand away as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. That would be kind of event processing rather than transaction processing, which is, oh, I feel hot. I wonder what I shall do with hotness. So 
so it's like it's very interesting what you're doing. It, are there any products like you? Because I mean, I know SQL Base and, and the other um, streams processing database people, but they're not doing what you're doing. Is there anything? That's yeah, you know, the funny thing is, we were here at the beginning and we took the, the hard path. We you know, we made the tough call, which is let's do it for SQL standards because we saw that there were the window constructs were there, the interval ta uh, data types were there. Most of the stuff is there. We actually validate our queries against IBM uh, DB2 and Oracle's uh, latest and greatest technologies. Now, we do go beyond what they can do, obviously, but the core of our system is SQL Standards 2008 compliant, and we make sure that, uh, that what we're doing is, is correct. All of the other kind of, you mentioned the SEP or KEP type products, uh, they have the same pattern. Basically, they invent, they've invented their own language, whether it's completely different from SQL or SQL-like. It certainly isn't SQL. It's a bit like uh, trying to understand uh, a Jamaican pigeon or something, you know, um, <laughs> it's, when we talk in English, uh, you know, you, uh, or comparing JavaScript to Java. They, they're quite different. And you want, so... Um, SQL is the, lang is the lingua franca. It's the language that, you know, if you go to Europe and you want to talk business or science, you'll be talking English, and SQL is that for data management. It's not perfect, but it is the one that everyone has adopted. So we took that tough call. And with the KEP products, they've got their own proprietary languages, and they're, not designed, they're really designed for filtering and pattern matching, mm -hmm. whereas many of our applications will amplify the data streams. You know, we may, for example, interpolate and deduce missing data values and put those out as well. It's not just a matter of filtering. But the other KEP or SEP Well, that's what I was thinking. Will, you know, in terms of the diagram I threw up, the, in event filtering and replication and routing, is that there's a function there for events, but you could do that. You could just sit there in front of the hose and you could do all oh, that. Oh, absolutely. Stuff. And we do it, do it very well based on standard SQL, absolutely. In fact, um, you know, in some of these competitive comparisons, customers have come back and found out that with some of these other products that you've, you've mentioned, that, that it's an order of magnitude less code doing it in SQL Stream. Plus, it runs about five times faster. The other thing is that with those products, most of them you push a button and you generate programs. They compile them into Java programs or in C++ programs. C++ in the case of... Uh, um, uh, IBM's uh, InfoSphere Streams product. But that product language is proprietary, and when you've written and created those programs, you can't change the logic. You have to basically, if you want to make any changes to any of those rules, add new views, you've got to rebuild your programs, you've got to take the application down, you've got to rebuild, recompile, and so on. Whereas we view this as a data management opportunity, you know, managing streaming big data. And so we want you to be able to create new views, have new views that operate and coexist with other views, Add new data sources without stopping. You know that's the whole way we look at it. And there's no other product, amazingly, out there that actually has done that. And I think it's because we weren't influenced by the other people that got pulled into complex event processing or into other areas. We decided from the get-go this is the problem we wanted to solve. It just took us a long time to actually pull those 1.3 million lines of code together to do it. Okay. Well, I'd better hand you to the audience. I've gone far too long. Eric, I presume you have some questions. Uh, yes, indeed. We have a few good ones here. So, Damien, I'll just dive right in. We've got a couple of good questions here. So, let's see. Okay, so one of the attendees asks, is that fine-grained parallelism, parallelism processing one of the, the patents that you referenced? It seems like a game changer. That's what one attendee writes. Um, the whole relational stream processing is what we've actually patented in a very abstract way. You can have a look at it. Those patents are in the public domain. You can find them. There are five right now. Actually, the fifth one has been granted recently, so it's about doing sophisticated uh, data recovery, so how the, the, uh, the network will, will recover itself after a collapse. But you can read through it and you can see it. So it's, not, it's, it's much broader than just SQL. It's, it's using relational operators. It's processing tuples, if you know uh -huh. See sort of the technical term for record, it's records with fields, and using the continuous uh, relational operators upon them. And those patterns date back to 2002. Okay, good. And you talked about this briefly, but maybe you can go into some detail. We have a couple questions about the big competitors. Of course, Golden Gate was acquired by Oracle, and IBM WebSphere also has streams. And IBM is streams, talking a lot yeah. more about streams these days, uh, just in the last eight months or so. How would you compare what you guys are doing with what your understanding of those technologies happens to be? Well, InfoSphere Streamed is interesting because it started off as a project called System S, and many of us know that System R is what gave birth to the SQL language and, uh, and the relational database, Oracle and, and everybody else. 
interestingly, even though IBM invented the SQL language, um, System R decided, uh, System S decided to go its own way, came out as Infosphere Streams as a proprietary language that uh, was originally called Spade and then Spade 2, and now I think it's called SPL2. But it really looks nothing like SQL, therefore you need to either embrace the whole idea, IBM world or and uh, try and retrain yourself and understand that, in which case all of the investment you put into logic will never run on any other systems. You can't run it on databases, etc., which becomes obviously a lock-in point, something they probably quite enjoy. The other thing is, is that it compiles into C++, and then when you change those definitions, etc., you've got to take the application down, you've got to recompile, rebuild it, regenerate it, recompile it, relink it, and so on. So... Um, we think those are, you know, they don't look at this, obviously, as a data management challenge and paradigm that we do. The other comparison between the two companies is that they started in 2003 like we did, and they came to market in 2009, the same as us. So there's an interesting sort of, uh, obviously, it was at the right time for the two companies to see those challenges. We came from the background of telecom. They came from, I think, military applications, and we've both taken our own path. The biggest irony is that we are SQL standards compliant, and they are. <laughs> that is kind of an ironic twist, isn't it? It that's is. You know, it's, uh, I was worried for a long time, but I mean, we're the only company that seems to have done that. And I think because the SQL standard is so big now, it's pretty daunting for anyone to, to do that. And a lot of the people that are doing these kind of work are not the database type people. They may be the middleware people or there's something else, you know. Yeah, well, that's a great segue, actually. We have a question around middleware and messaging. One of the attendees asks, uh, let me just get it exactly. Will this eliminate the need of messaging software in place to handle the real-time processing in traditional data warehousing? Well, um, obviously, uh, we've been going for 10 years now, and it's taken us quite a while to build this. We believe that the paradigm has got a lot of legs and that it has the ability to completely solve the data integration challenge, which I think is one of the last big you know, headaches that's out there. And uh, a declarative version of messaging middleware would be very attractive. But where we are today is there's a lot of you know, value that's provided in messaging middleware in terms of very low latency performance, in terms of different kinds of transport layers that are supported, and um, you know, highly tuned and, and, and efficient middleware that's operating in financial services, in control systems, and so on. And in which case, we provide a very nice high-level interface that's seamlessly um, and um, for, you know, plugs and slides into that paradigm because it is a stream processing paradigm. It's just that that's a stream. The messaging middleware is a stream processing paradigm with hierarchies of topics and basically doing your processing outside of the middleware layer, um, whereas ours is to make this all declarative data management. So we think in the you know in the long run, in 10 years' time, we would expect that um, if we do a good job and execute well, that we will obviate the need for a lot of those kind of technologies, but they've got, obviously got a lot of life left in them yet and, uh, and provide a lot of value, and, and there's some very good partners of ours. Sure, and you, know, you mentioned that you got your early beginnings in the telecom industry. It seems to me a lot of very powerful technology comes out of that industry, frankly, because you had so much data and latency is such a huge issue. It's almost like telecom is a, a crucible in which some very bulletproof and powerful technologies can be cooked. Is that a, a fair assessment? Absolutely. I mean, they have some of the you know the biggest big data, and as the pipes get bigger and fatter, they're at the heart of it all. They've got to manage those. They've got to deal with. I mean, for example, challenges of dealing with IPv6 and IPv4 correlations, because most of us are not able to uh, operate uh, and process on most applications, not able to process. You know, the full 128-bit uh, Internet addresses that the V6 standard brings. And, of course, with that comes things like compliance, where you have to track uh, through um, from the V6 usage through to the actual V4 addresses, which get reused and overlaid by different applications, users, uh, organizations, and so on. And as you can just think about that, the amount of data that's involved, every packet that's flowing, you've got to do some sort of, or every flow of uh, subflow on the internet you have to try and work out and correlate so they, there are certainly huge huge applications in telecom and um, also in signal processing dealing with mobile networks mm -hmm. um, I mean just think about it now I don't know I think my uh, and a plug here for <laughs> Apple iPhone but my LTE uh, iPhone 5 I think is uh, certainly its upload speed is faster than my uh, cable network at home mm -hmm. and um, 
I, 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 you know, the writing is on the wall that the mobile devices are going to actually have uh, faster performance than than the uh, than the wired devices. You know, within within certainly within the next decade. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Here's a very interesting question from one of our attendees, asking about um, statistics, and and asks basically, you know, SQL. He says is really not great with statistics typically. So how does that work? And the question is, do you apply statistics on the data? Uh, through some other language, or how are you doing that? And he notes that that uh, SQL is not typically very good with statistics. Well, I think it's a fair point, and you know we can't, we don't aim to be all things to all people. Um, what we do is we 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 do provide the, you know, the groupings and aggregations and correlations and joins and so on, but um, we use the mechanism to extend the processing to external systems that's defined within the SQL standard. Um, um, for how you actually build user-defined functions and stream transforms. Originally, there were the blade technology that came, I think, originally from Informix and then found itself into the, uh, into the SQL standard. And so you can then interface to your other external systems that can process, as long as they can process one or more records and return one or more records back, then it'll be, it can be plugged into this paradigm. And we'll just take the answers from your external you know, SAS system or whatever it might be that is going to be doing the statistical analysis that you want. And then, of course, once we've captured those result fields, they're appended to the record and they get carried along with the data. And you can then make other uh, intelligent decisions, routing, aggregation, uh, joins, or whatever that might be important to you. So uh, the idea here is to use it as a, a real-time you know, streaming big data infrastructure that can then embrace and integrate with the other you know, excellent technologies that are out there. We're there to yeah, try and right. make it better, not to replace them. I don't think we're there to replace any of them, actually. That's interesting. And one, I'll throw one last question. I love this slide because this really gives some very granular detail into how this stuff works and what it looks like. It reminds me of the whole predictive algorithm business where you design an algorithm, you do some regression modeling perhaps, uh, it works really well, and then it, sooner or later you want to change the parameters because you're no longer getting the kind of lift that you want or the kind of return or the kind of results that you want. Is there some kind of repository that can be where you can store the different rules or the different um, parameters that you've tinkered around with and the results? In other words, is there a management environment? Would that be in the studio, for example, where someone who is new to the company maybe that has been using this for a while can take a look at some of the past applications and then maybe borrow bits and pieces from some of those rules or from some of these parameters? Yeah, absolutely. Within Studio, you're browsing the metadata, and you can see things like foreign streams where you're encapsulating external data sources, the various kinds of adapters. You can partition uh, the data into schemas, name schemas, um, so that you can, you know, modularize the information, and then you can find, you know, bits of SQL that you want to reuse or address. Mm -hmm. And then in the case of S-Analyzer, it will generate the stuff for you as well, so it provides a kind of a higher-level interface on top of that, and it will generate SQL code for you, which you can then take advantage of too. Okay, so that's that sounds great. Clips. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, folks, uh, thank you so much for attending the first briefing room of 2013. We've got a whole bunch lined up for you over the course of this year. Uh, for more information, you can always email yours truly. You should have an email from me, from me somewhere. Of course, we archive all of these webcasts. Go to insideanalysis.com. Look under webcast under the briefing room, and you can see all the ones from last year and from 2011 and even from way back in 2010. So this does conclude our event for today. But thank you so much for your time and attention. What a great show. What a great way to start the year. Take care, folks. And, and anybody wants to get the hold on the technology, please you know, just apply for a download, and we'll let you um, evaluate the technology and get your hands on it. That's um, it. As soon as That's today, it. as you wish. SQLstream.com, right? Absolutely. absolutely. SQLstream.com, SQLstream.com. Okay, Thanks, guys. everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Happy New Year.